Um, so I'm, I'm happy to make this presentation to you folks down at the uh, Panama City <coughs> Amateur Radio Club in Florida. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, meet all of you tonight and, and do this presentation. And as Greg pointed out, I'm involved in all kinds of different things related to uh, amateur radio. There's just so much to do, and I've been uh, having fun doing uh, as much of it as I can. Uh, so as Greg pointed out, I got my first tech license in 2007 and uh, you know, gradually upgraded to extra in 2009. Uh, I was a club president up here of uh, PART, which stands for the Police Amateur Radio Team. Uh, in the very, very beginning, we were very closely associated with the Westford, uh, Massachusetts Police Department. Uh, so I did that for 10 years. Uh, I've done some things with the section. I was a assistant section manager and club coordinator for a couple of years there. And back in 1997, I lived in Worcester, Massachusetts, and I founded a Linux users group there. Uh, and that Linux users group is still uh, very actively uh, going along. They've got about 20 members, and, and they're doing really well. Uh, for those of you who might be familiar with meetup.com, there's uh, all kinds of different uh, meetings that are, are, are hosted on that site. And I did uh, one of those for about 14 years uh, in the town of Chelmsford, Massachusetts, which is next door to where I live now. Um, I even did some teaching of, of Linux through the adult education program when I lived in Chelmsford and had a lot, a lot of fun doing that. Uh, I've been using Linux uh, since 1997. And by day, I'm a computer engineer. I used to design uh, computer circuits that live inside of computer chips. And now I simulate all of that stuff and uh, try to break it so that uh, the customer gets a much higher quality product. They never see these flaws. We, we simulate everything and hopefully find the bugs before we, we fabricate a chip. So to say that I live in simulated reality for part of the day at least is, is not an untrue statement. Uh, so most recently, what have I been interested in? Um, I like to electrically restore some of these 1920s and 30s radios. Uh, I'm not trying to make museum pieces out of them. I'm not a woodworker, but I'm pretty handy with a soldering iron. I like to get in there and replace the capacitors and the, the, uh, the crusty wires and things like that and bring them back to life. I've done about 10 or 15 of them and uh, had a lot of fun with it. Uh, I like to build kits. I like to do home brewing. And uh, our club is going to be doing the Morserino kit coming up soon uh, for people to practice CW and learn how to use paddles and all that sort of thing. Uh, I'm a straight key user now. I don't have much experience with paddles. And I'm hoping that uh, I'll, I'll get better at using paddles and also get my speed up a little bit and uh, ideally learn to do some head copy because beyond a certain point, you can't write it down. It's too fast. Um, and at one point, I decided to build a, a, a radio receiver. I built a 1920s style regenerative receiver uh, with pluggable coils for different frequency ranges. It works really well, uh, especially when I hook it up to my uh, 80 meter delta loop. Uh, it, that pulls in the signals like crazy. Uh, FT8 and grid tracker are, are things that I, uh, I've, I've participated in quite a bit. Uh, fox hunting. Uh, I haven't actually jumped into the M17 project, which I'll talk about later. Uh, it's for a, a free, uh, it's, it's free software, digital voice. And uh, of course, you know, the Andy's ham radio Linux, uh, which I've been doing for, oh, at least 10 years now. So when I created Andy's ham radio Linux, what were my goals? Well, I wanted to promote Linux. That's what I use uh, almost exclusively. I, I use Apple or, or Windows. All my computers at home are Linux, and I, I use a Linux computer at work all the time. Uh, and, and part of the Linux community and also the ham radio community is to give something back to the community, whether you Elmer people or you give talks or you're a club officer or, or something along those lines. Give, give something back to those communities. And this is one way uh, that I do that. Uh, but I, I didn't want to invent this uh, from scratch, so I built it. Uh, on top of an existing Linux distribution called Ubuntu. And I, I remastered Ubuntu, meaning I changed the mixture of software that, that gets distributed. And I put a lot of ham radio things in there for people. Uh, I wanted to find as much uh, free and open source ham radio software as I could. Nothing proprietary on there as far as I know. And the goal is everything just works. Now, that's a pretty lofty goal for computers that everything just works. But, but that's the goal. Put it in there tie it into a menu, the user clicks it, the program comes up, and, and hopefully there are no, no issues with the program itself. But 
I didn't want to create another excuse for people to have to babysit yet another computer. Uh, I wanted the focus to be on the radio hobby. So the, the computer ends up being a tool to assist with enjoying the radio hobby, not, not another painful thing to have to do installs and, and things like that on. So that's where I got the idea for Andy's Ham Radio Linux. And here's a, at a high level what, what you would need to do to, uh, to use it. So version 25A is the latest version that I released and I released it uh, just before Dayton last year in May. Uh, I expect to come up with another version uh, sometime between now and, and in May uh, to just refresh uh, the software that's on there. Uh, so when you, when you go to the SourceForge website uh, and you look for Andy's Ham Radio Linux or you search for my call sign, uh, you'll see an ISO file that's on the order of uh, four gigabytes or maybe it's up to five now, but it's a pretty good size file. Um, download that file and then there's a, a getting started guide you would read that would tell you how to transfer that to a, a thumb drive uh, for USB that you would then boot. And uh, ultimately, if you wanted to, you could install it. Uh, but sometimes people want to just kick the tires on the software. They don't, they don't want to install it on the computer just yet. So you could use something like VirtualBox, uh, for those of you who, who may be familiar with that. It's literally like running a computer inside of a computer. And in VirtualBox, you can play with it to your heart's content, see what it does, see if it's to your liking, and so forth. Um, Sometimes people are nervous about taking their, their good computer, which may very well be running Windows. Uh, it is possible to configure your computer to boot Windows and Linux, uh, but some, some folks are, are a little cautious about that. So take an older laptop, take one that's five or six years old and try it there. Uh, I think you'll be surprised that it works pretty well. And uh, be sure to read the Getting Started Guide. There's like one or two little gotchas uh, that happen exactly once. And uh, once you uh, read that guide and get past it, uh, you should be home free. So what kind of a computer would you want to run this on? Well, any 64-bit uh, any computer, 10 years old or less, ought to do the trick. Uh, it needs to have USB. Uh, uh, Apple computers, I don't think, will work. Uh, but any standard you know, PC type computer will. Um, you need at least four gigabytes of memory in these days, machines have an awful lot more than that. And disk space is like 20 or 25 gigabytes after the installation. And, and nowadays uh, hard drives, uh, uh, SSD drives have you know, hundreds of gigabytes on them. So that shouldn't be an issue. Uh, and processor speed is not that big of an issue uh, with the exception of software defined radio programs. But even at that, uh, uh, a five or six year old computer really should have no trouble uh, running that stuff. There shouldn't be an issue. Uh, networking, well, not too many computers have wired networks anywhere, but that would work uh, or wireless and you do need USB uh, to do the installation. Now, before I go on, let me take a breath here. Uh, does anybody have any questions uh, up to this point? It's been very general so far uh, of what you have to do. Uh, what I'm gonna do now is show some screenshots and dive in a little bit. What does it look like? What's on there? Uh, you know, why, why would I want to do this? Uh, so are there any questions before I go on? Hey, Andy, I've, I've got a comment, if you don't mind. Yes. Um, I, I put, I uh, loaded the software onto the two uh, laptops and I donated them to the club. So if anybody wants to check this out, uh, I've get, taken the first step to getting it. It's, it's all set up and running. Uh, on the two laptops and the club can loan those out. So, uh, and I think, you know, I don't have a problem if we loan some up to the Dothan guys either. Well, that's great, Bob. Thanks very much. I appreciate you doing that. Um, some folks are a little bit uh, nervous about doing installs or maybe they don't quite have that skill set yet. And so I'm sure that'll be appreciated by folks who can uh, kick the tires and, and see if it's to their liking. Okay, I'm going to go on here and see what we what we get. If there are questions, you can feel free to interrupt me or save them for the end as you wish. So when you um, when you boot up the uh, USB thumb drive that you created by following the instructions in the Getting Started Guide, you'll get a screen that looks very much like this, and it ought to look kind of familiar. You've got you know icons in the background, which you know if you click them, it does what you expect. Uh, you have a few icons along the bottom, uh, which you can customize uh, to your liking. You put whatever programs there you want. 
And in this windowing interface, uh, if you notice uh, at the top left-hand corner, there's a round circle and that, that white thing inside of it is supposed to be a rat. And if you click that round uh, button there, you will get a menu. And then from there, you can uh, find the application of interest and, uh, and fire it up that way. Now, it's possible that maybe you don't know the name of the application. It might have a different name on, on Linux versus Windows, but uh, it, it's a starting point. And, and hopefully you can you know, eventually find what program you want to run. Can you click that rat for us? Uh, not on this, not on this slide, oh, no, because okay. this is a PDF file, but I could attempt to do a, a live demo, uh, after I'm done with the slide set and I can, I can show you that what I tried no, to do. Okay. Uh, let me see. The next slide may have it. Um, no, uh, there's a couple of slides ahead where I, I do have that menu shown. And so I'll, I'll try to get to that. If I forget, remind me at the end and I'll, I'll do it for you. So um, I, I, I can't emphasize enough, please read the Getting Started Guide. Uh, many times people write to me and say, you know, Andy, I got stuck, this doesn't work or that doesn't work. And 99.9% .9 of the time, it's because they either didn't read this document or they didn't follow the directions. Uh, Bob, did you think when you, when you did this that the directions were so hard to follow or was it a piece of cake for you? Uh, it was, it was, uh... I made an assumption <laughs> that uh, was not in the directions and that threw me off for a while. But once I followed them exactly, it worked perfectly. Okay, great. Thank you. I'm glad to hear that. And, you know, honestly, if I knew how to fix the issue that this thing works around, I, I would fix it and then nobody would ever have to worry about this. But despite my best efforts, I have not been able to uh, fix whatever that issue is. Um, so I, I encourage people to please read the document and uh, I have not yet found a person who read the document and followed it and, and still couldn't get things running. Although, yes, there is, uh, uh, you know, there's always the, the uh, uh, uncooperative computer that somebody likely has, but uh, by and large, it, it works pretty well for folks. The well, we're the males of the species. We're I'm the sorry. males of the species. We don't read instructions. <laughs> well, well I, I realize that if you're male and you read instructions, that's kind of a sign of weakness, like looking at a, at a roadmap uh, before GPS existed. But uh, in this one case, I'm going to ask you to please do it. And if you want to make sure nobody's watching when you do it, that that's okay. I'll go along with that. Um, I just want to add that uh, the biggest trouble I had uh, installing this on three PCs were the BIOS settings in the PC. Once I got that right, it was like three or four different bio settings that could get in the way or need to be enabled a particular way to get this thing to, to boot. And as soon as I got there, it worked fine, but it took a little experimentation. Okay, that, that's an interesting feedback, Bob. Thanks. I, I haven't heard that from folks before, uh, but maybe uh, if you can send me a quick email with what you had to set, uh, and I know every BIOS is a little bit different, but if I can offer that as general guidance to people, maybe that will help them. I put some notes up on your... Uh, on your discussion uh, page. Okay, yeah, I'll check that. I'm a little bit behind on those. There's about 10 or 15 of those I haven't caught up with yet, but uh, I'll certainly be on the lookout for that. Uh, so what, after you've uh, installed everything and, and followed the directions in the Getting Started Guide and rebooted, you'll see a screen that looks something like this where it will prompt you for your username and your password, and then you'll click the login button. Um, you've probably seen things like this many, many times. This one's maybe graphically a little bit different, but it's the same uh, general idea as, as what you're used to. Now, if it says other, that means you did something wrong. It should say whatever username uh, you gave it when you, when you followed those instructions. So if you, if you do it and you get stuck at this point, this is the, the workaround for it. Um, although it's preferable to just do it first from the getting started guy, but there is a way out of it. Um, the, there's a default user called X Ubuntu, or some people would pronounce it Zubuntu, um, and just log in with that account with an empty password. And I put a script uh, in there in the root directory where if you run it from a terminal window, log out and log back in, it, it does uh, the same fix. Uh, so you know, one way or the other, you can do the quick fix and you do it exactly once. And once you've done it, you never have to do it again. So this is what your login screen should really look like if you created a user called Andy and then you type in uh, whatever password uh, you gave it and then you should be in. 
And here's what the menu looks like for the, the person who asked me about that. And so uh, most of this menuing system is created by Ubuntu and, and all the software that's in there. But I didn't want to mess around with moving things around within that system because I was afraid that a subsequent installation of software would change it back. So what I did is I added a menu to it called Andy's Ham Radio Linux. And you can see that off in the right-hand column, it's highlighted. Uh, I added that and within that menu, you can see all the sub menus that I put in there to organize the software in, in what I thought a way that made sense. Uh, but you can probably find these programs like there's a, there's a ham radio menu here that Ubuntu created. And so some of the ham radio programs might be in a couple of different places, but, but this was my attempt to, to organize things in what I thought was a reasonable fashion. So uh, I'm not going to go through every menu item of every program that's on here. There's oh, at least 50 or 60 different programs on here. But you can see the categories I picked. Uh, things for antennas and antenna modeling, uh, CW digital modes. Uh, there's some documentation on there. Uh, electronic design. Many people are uh, you know, building their own circuit boards for kits, doing uh, electronic design. Uh, I think the Arduino stuff is in that directory. Uh, and so on and so forth, propagation, logging, uh, and all the way down to SDR. So I'm going to touch on those uh, at a high level just to give you a feel for what, what's in here. So of, of course, you likely want to customize this somewhat. You may or may not like the penguin in the background. And so I found a few uh, pieces of wallpaper that were covered under uh, free software licenses or Creative Commons or, or some other uh, equally free type of license. And I included them in here for you. So if you just right click on the background, uh, you can go in and change uh, your wallpaper to anything you want, or you can download a wallpaper and do it that way uh, as well. Uh, one of the things about Linux, if you're not familiar, is uh, there's an awful lot of ability to customize it. Uh, I won't say infinitely, but there's a lot of, of customization you can do. And uh, rightfully so, many people view that as complexity. Other people view it as absolutely necessary to tweak the computer and get it to behave exactly the way you think it should behave. So inside of the, uh, the menu here, you can see I, I opened up the documentation menu briefly. And uh, there's, there's a few programs that are based on the command line and everything else is based on uh, a graphical user interface. And if I didn't list these programs here, you might never know that I installed them at all unless you went looking for them. So that, that's part of the reason I did it. And by clicking on each of these, it would bring up the appropriate manual page in text mode uh, where you could read about the program and see what's going on. But uh, other than those, uh, perhaps a dozen programs or so, everything else is graphically oriented as you would probably expect. So when you, when you click on that, of course, you get the, uh, this is the directory listing that I can see in the browser uh, using Firefox in this case. And uh, there's all kinds of how-to documents that I created for how to do different things in ham radio. And uh, so you can read through here, the, of course, the getting started document that I've mentioned many times. Uh, what's changed between uh, this version of ham radio Linux or Andy's ham radio Linux and the previous one? Uh, sources. Uh, many things I downloaded directly from source code and compiled it for you because it didn't live in uh, the Ubuntu repository. And so uh, I listed the places from which I downloaded that stuff uh, so that you could see it. Uh, and I also put in a, a, a document about manual dexterity solutions. Uh, my Elmer has Parkinson's disease and his, uh, his dexterity is, is uh, fading fast. And there are some things that you can do uh, to customize your graphical windowing environment to hopefully make it easier for folks with dexterity issues to interact with the computer. So the things that I found, I, I put in a document here and hopefully it will help somebody in the future. So there's all kinds of stuff to look at there. Um, so in the, uh, in the antenna uh, menu, there's uh, a, a few programs that are in here. Uh, one of them is a link to a website where you can do your ARV exposure calculations, uh, which are now required by the FCC. Uh, there's a, a program in there for uh, if, if you want to design a, a Moxon rectangle antenna and know what dimensions to use. 
uh, antenna modeling with XNEC 2C and uh, the uh, AA Analyzer program from uh, Dave Fries. He's got FL Digi, FL this, FL that, and, and he's also got FLAA in there. Uh, for CW, there's uh, quite a few different programs in here for practicing CW. Um, and uh, for, you know, the computer will generate noises, uh, beeps, and you write down what you've heard. And it's, it's uh, five character groups uh, where you can uh, practice your CW that way and get some feedback. Uh, for digital modes, you see quite a few programs as well. And I, I won't go every single one of them, but you'll recognize some of them. FL Digi, uh, you should recognize it looks the same on, on Linux as it does in other operating systems. Uh, Grid Tracker is an excellent piece of software we'll talk about later. And, and all these programs that start with FL are all from uh, Dave Fries down in uh, is either Georgia or Alabama. I forget which, but he's down there somewhere. So uh, this is a program that I wrote, probably four or five programs on here I actually wrote and everything else I downloaded from the internet and included uh, in the software collection for you. Uh, but if you want to build a Moxon rectangle antenna, and I did this once, it worked really well, you would type in your frequency of interest, uh, your wire size, your uh, if it's American wire gauge or somebody else's wire gauge, you can pick that from in here and uh, pick your your whether you want inches or feet or millimeters, whatever units you want. And you can see the dimensions already on the picture. Hit calculate and it'll tell you uh, the approximate size that you would need in order to build this antenna. Uh, further, you can output it as a PDF file. So you can bring this picture into your, your workshop and build it. And it'll also create a file that you can send to xnec 2 c for antenna modeling. So you can see uh, what kind of characteristics this antenna has. And uh, if you haven't seen it, this is xnec 2 c where uh, I've got three different windows open. Uh, you can see the Moxon rectangle antenna over there uh, on the right with a vertical orientation. And uh, the, the picture in the middle shows you, you know, where is the signal going to go at, at this particular frequency of, of 153 megahertz? It's mostly going uh, in the forward direction. Uh, and the other window that you can see on the left shows you gain and front, back, front to back ratio and a predicted SWR. And of course, we all know, you know when you put an antenna up, it's affected by all sorts of things that are in its it, you know, relatively near proximity. So these are predictions. But if you build it correctly and put it out in the clear somewhere, you, you ought to get good results with it. Um, around here, we, we do some things called fox hunting, where somebody will hide a very low power transmitter, maybe 10, 15, 20 milliwatts. Uh, we'll hide it in the local uh, forest, in the conservation land or something. And uh, people will go out with uh, antennas and try to find it uh, using a variety of techniques. And there's a device out there by a, a company called Bionics called a MicroFox. And I wrote the Linux software that talks to that device it looks uh, an awful lot like the uh, equivalent Windows program, but it's totally different source code. And you can configure all different things, uh, you know, the message that it produces and how often it, it replays that message and so forth. And uh, we have quite a few people around here that like to do that. Uh, not so much in the cold January Massachusetts weather, but certainly in the spring through the fall. Uh, I mentioned uh, Morse code practice earlier. This program XCWCP will generate uh, character groups for you, which you would write down on paper and then go back and compare to uh, what you have here. And then there's all manner of things to change the words per minute, the tone and uh, the letter. It's there's more than just letter groups. There's CW words, you know, like QTH and CQ and 73 words like that and, and other things that you can uh, have it drill you on. So I, I tried to put in a little something for everybody uh, in this software collection. And so digital modes, you can see there's a whole bunch of programs in there for digital modes. They're, they're pretty popular these days. Uh, earlier, somebody mentioned PSK31, FT8, FT4, uh, free digital voice uh, for, for people who may not be familiar with it. Um, all kinds of things in here, and I'll, I'll touch on a couple of them. So this should look familiar, WSJTX uh, uh, by K1JT and company uh, for doing uh, FT8 uh, with the waterfall at the bottom, the, uh, the, the uh, people that are on the air in one window and, and whoever you want to call in another. Um, I like to use this program uh, in, in, uh, in concert with, uh, with Grid Tracker. I think the two together complement each other very, very nicely. And 
Somewhere I have a grid tracker screenshot and I can show you how that works. Uh, so as of uh, the most recent version of Andy's Ham Radio Linux, Grid Tracker is installed by default. Uh, I, I can't say enough about this program. I think it is a most excellent piece of uh, free and open source software. Uh, it has some really excellent graphs, or, I'm sorry, uh, uh, maps of the world. They will highlight the, uh, the QSOs that you're hearing. Uh, it'll show you when you when you uh, call somebody, it'll draw an arrow on the map and show you uh, who you're talking to so you can see in the world uh, where that's going with FT8. And uh, it keeps track of all sorts of statistics for you if you want it to. Uh, it, it works very well with WSJTX and you can send your logs, you know, QSO by QSO, you can send them up to Logbook of the World and many other uh, logging services. And here's my attempt at a screenshot of that. And this, uh, frankly, doesn't do the software justice. Uh, so if you think this screenshot looks great, fire up the software. It looks a whole lot better, especially on a nice big monitor. Uh, but you can see the day night line. You can see uh, the countries of the world. The red squares are places, you know, grids that I contacted uh, and got uh, QSL information. And this, this is all grid based. Uh, so you can zoom in and see more details and so forth. Uh, the green line that you see between somewhere in the USA and somewhere in Europe is uh, somebody uh, having a QSO. Uh, and you can also see the day night line there. Uh, so if you want to play games with uh, you know, going along the gray line, you'll know when it's coming through for you. Uh, and down at the bottom, you can see those are the stations that are uh, calling CQ. Uh, you can filter that, that bottom uh, window to your heart's content. Uh, it's very, very flexible. Uh, I, I like to see people who are calling CQ and who are in grids that I might not have uh, communicated with previously. And uh, so that, that's how I have it set up. And then you just you know click the bottom window and it talks to WSJTX and you make the communication and, and these guys handshake and upload it and, and there you go. Uh, you do need a fairly good sized monitor for all these windows, but if you have that, uh, it, it makes um, using FT8, uh, I think a little more interesting. So other things that I have in here, electronic design. Um, I've done uh, quite a few projects with Arduinos. Uh, with my uh, crystal radio projects, I've wound some of my own coils and I wanted to get a feel for, you know, how many turns am I gonna need on, on such and such size coil? Um, some people are doing board design and so they want to look at uh, files that are appropriate for board design okay. before they send it to a, a, a shop to get fabricated. Uh, Anybody who's done circuit modeling is probably familiar with SPICE. Uh, KiCad is a, a schematic drawing program and, and on and on. So there's, there's quite a few different programs in there uh, for people who want to do uh, electronic design. And for those of you who uh, uh, have never uh, seen the Arduino GUI, so Arduino is a little small uh, circuit board that you can buy for, I don't know, what are they, like 25 bucks? They're not very expensive. Um, you can think of them as a glorified microcontroller, but that's not an entirely fair description either. It's, it's more capable than that. But you write these programs and it can do what you want it to do and you can interface it to uh, hardware that you build that you connect to the Arduino. And so this is a little simple program uh, where if you were able to scroll down and see it all, you, you'd see that it's, it would toggle an LED. And that, that's kind of like the Hello World program. If you see the LED blinking, you know that you wrote the software correctly, you've downloaded it correctly, your Arduino is powered, it's alive, all that kind of stuff. Uh, probably the most sophisticated program I wrote in the Arduino IDE was when I took um, one of those micro bit X radios from India and hacked the living daylights out of the hardware and the software and got it to uh, work with a voice synthesis chip uh, intending it to be used by uh, visually impaired hams. And I got it to work. I built two of them, but uh, it never went any further than that because the voice synthesis chip uh, went uh, end of life and I can't get it anymore. But it was a, it was a fun project uh, while I did it. Andy. Yes. And, uh, um, along with this, um, have you heard of uh, Chat GPT writing? I have programs? heard of Chat GPT, but I've not yet played with it. Was there more to the question, Bill? I just wondered if you had tried ChatGPT to write a program for you with with uh, Arduino. 
So, so no, I have not tried that, but, but to me, that's, that's almost no fun. Cause I like writing software, but if somebody <laughs> wants to try that and, and, and no, I don't, I don't mean that disparagingly, but uh, I, I haven't tried it. I, I have no idea how good uh, the result would be, um, you know, and for folks who, or perhaps don't have the programming uh, uh, expertise or, or don't want to spend the time at that low level, it, it might be a, a useful way to go, but I, I don't have that experience yet. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay, so uh, I found this program fairly recently and it looks pretty cool to me and I have used it to get pretty close to how many windings you need on a particular size form uh, to get the uh, desired inductance. Uh, you know, the, the crystal radios I built were tuning the AM broadcast band. And I found a, an online calculator that said, if you have this inductance and you have this capacitance, uh, it will be, it'll be resonant on uh, a frequency in the AM broadcast band and, and you can tune things in. But then you have to go and construct that. And, and typically you've got the variable capacitor uh, already and you, you need to wind the coil. And it, it's really not that hard to do. Uh, I've wound them on PVC. I've wound them on, on all kinds of different things. Uh, I've even made spider coils, which I think are really cool. And uh, they work pretty nicely for this. But, you know, you can do some calculation here of, you know, here's my wire diameter. Uh, here's the diameter of the form. Uh, here's roughly how many turns I need to, to get the number of uh, micro Henry's that I need and uh, put a half a dozen more on uh, tape it down measure it and and uh, you probably have to unwind a couple uh, to get it to right where you want but it gets you in the ballpark it works pretty well uh, I haven't done uh, computer based uh, schematics in a long long time I did it at the beginning of my career but I haven't done it lately but for folks who uh, want to uh, participate in that there's uh, software out there uh, that will let you do just that. And the, uh, the software uh, from the schematic will generate appropriate files for a board manufacturer, uh, bill of materials, and so forth. So another menu that's in there is uh, for HF propagation. You know, we, we always want to get a prediction of, you know, can I talk to China today or do I have to wait three months or what time of day is the best time of day? Uh, wh whatever destination you, you might uh, uh, want to want to communicate with, uh, the HF propagation programs can help. And uh, some of them are installed on here and a couple of them are links to uh, websites. So VOA cap, for example, uh, is, is a link to a website that has uh, lots of capability to make these predictions, uh, tell you what band to use at what time of day to have the best uh, likelihood to make the contact and so forth. Uh, some people have probably seen this, this top image of floating around uh, where it tells you, you know, what are the predicted band conditions? Uh, what are the different uh, uh, numbers associated with the sun uh, and, and so on and so forth. And I got permission from this gentleman to include it in uh, Andy's Ham Radio Linux so that if you just click a button, you can get that immediately uh, without worrying about, uh, you know, finding a website that has it. Uh, another program that's a little quick program that I found uh, uh, where you can type in uh, your grid and somebody else's grid and it will tell you the bearing and the distance and all that kind of thing. Uh, I found that comes in handy when I want to aim my uh, Yagi antenna at somebody. Uh, that's one of many ways uh, to do that. Uh, this is a screenshot of VOA cap. Uh, this is their website. And I, I, I did this. So from where I am in Massachusetts, I said, well, what happens if I want to talk to somebody in uh, South Africa, let's say, so you can see on the right, it, it drew the path, the short path, uh, you could do long path uh, uh, prediction. Also, you tell it, all right, I'm going to do CW at full power and tell it something about your antenna when you click those buttons. And it, one of the things that it will generate is this, uh, this circular uh, chart or graph here with uh, predictions as to what band and what time of day are will have the highest likelihood of making that contact. And so if you follow the color codes along the bottom, you'll see, okay, this 90% uh, is approximately orange, 100% red by my eyes. And you can see, well, that looks like uh, 1,700 hours uh, on uh, probably the 15 meter band or 17 meter band, something like that. And so you get an idea of what has a chance of working and what probably has no chance of working or, or very low chance. 
Um, one of the things we hams like to do is we like to log our contacts and there's at least two programs on here uh, for doing that. Uh, this is a piece of software called Xlog, which I did not write it originally, but I'm now the, the current maintainer of the software. And I use this to do all my logging. Um, it is, um, I would call it a casual user's logging software. This does not have all the bells and whistles that a contester would want. There's a, a different piece of software for that. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But I have used this at Field Day. I have used this as uh, Kilo 2 Hotel one of the 13 colonies stations in uh, call area one here. And uh, if you know two or three keyboard shortcuts, you can go pretty quickly with it. Uh, one nice thing is saves the uh, uh, information in a flat text file. But one of the bad things is it saves everything in a flat text file. Um, you can get yourself out of a pickle with the right editor if, if you ever get in one. Uh, but usually that's not a problem. But you can see it's got all the basic fields, uh, your, your date, your UTC and so forth. Um, and there are other windows you can open that said, you know, I worked this person before and, and so on and so forth. Uh, this software is probably, I don't know, 15 years old. It's been out there for a long time. And uh, there's really very little maintenance I've had to do to it other than uh, update it when the ADIF uh, specification changes to make sure this generates a, a, uh, a file that's uh, up to the latest spec. Uh, CQR log is based on, it uses a database to store all of its information. And uh, I haven't used it extensively, but you can see there's all kinds of fields in there. Uh, it will go out to various web websites and try to fill in those fields for you uh, as you make the contact. Uh, and it keeps track of all manner of statistics uh, for you. It, it's highly customizable and it is intended for uh, the needs of uh, the contester. Uh, another menu here is the, the NBeams menu, uh, Narrow Band Emergency Messaging System. It is another way to do things uh, as opposed to uh, WinLink, which uh, as far as I know, only runs on Windows computers. And I'm not aware of a way for Linux folks to uh, participate in a WinLink network, uh, although I think people are working on it. Uh, but NBeams uses some of the software that was created by uh, Dave Fries, WNHKJ, uh, and um, I've, I've got that listed here. And uh, many emergency management uh, organizations across the country use this. It's an open source software suite, whereas I, uh, WinLink, I believe, is not open source. It's proprietary, but it is free to download and use. Uh, this uh, suite of software runs on the three major operating systems, Linux, Windows, uh, and uh, Apple OS, uh, was it OS 10? I guess it is. Uh, there's no infrastructure required. You don't have to have some server that's up and running already uh, that you have to talk to. It's just, you know, my radio's up, your radio's up. We both have the software. We want to communicate. Here you go. Um, and there's even an email program tied in with it. So if you wanted to send short, simple text emails, um, you can do that. Um, rig control. So there's quite a few programs in here related to rig control. Uh, I'm just going to go over them briefly. Um, this one, uh, a gentleman wrote uh, specifically for uh, ICOM 7300, 7610s, and other uh, radios from ICON, relatively modern ones. And you can uh, look at a variety of features from this graphical interface. Uh, it talks directly to the radio. Uh, you can do controls here. Um, I don't know. I suppose this could be used in a remote radio situation, but I've not tried it that way. Uh, but some folks uh, would rather do uh, push buttons on the computer than push buttons on the radio. So this is uh, an alternative way to, uh, to control your rig. Uh, I also have a program in here for satellites for, uh, for accessing the uh, AMSAT satellites. And so uh, you, would, you would use this program to analyze the uh, telemetry that you would hear from a variety of satellites. And uh, AMSAT updates this program periodically, and I try to get a, the latest version on here that I can uh, for folks that are interested in uh, playing with the satellites. Uh, I happen to like this program. I haven't used it in a while, but when I did satellites, I used it all the time. It's called G-Predict, and it draws a nice map. Here it looks a little squished. On a bigger monitor, it looks better. But it shows you, uh, you can tell it's dated because there's a couple of satellites on there that I'm not even sure are in orbit anymore. Um, but 
Uh, you can see the uh, the footprint on the ground of where you know you have a fighting chance of hearing uh, the satellite. Uh, if you click other button it will show you the path of said satellite. Uh, it'll tell you when the next time is that the satellite will be uh, in range of your QTH, which you can program into it. Uh, it also has uh, a way to control an azimuth uh, elevation rotator. And I, I built a homebrew one and used an Arduino to communicate with this to get it to aim my antenna. Uh, and and it, it'll talk to other rotators as well. It's, it's pretty nice. Uh, it's pretty stable. I haven't had any problems with it. It's been out there a while. And uh, if you want to play with satellites and things, uh, this is one way to do it. Software-defined radio. We're doing a lot of that these days. In fact, uh, most of the new radios uh, have uh, computers inside them and are software-defined. And the uh, push-button interfaces that we're used to are merely uh, suggestions to the computer to do different things. Uh, there's a, a really very powerful piece of software called the GNU Radio Companion. And you can quite literally draw a block diagram of a signal processing application and hit the go button. And it will quite literally write the software for you and, and, and do uh, that signal processing. Uh, you can tell it to uh, use a variety of devices as input. You might want to use your speaker as output, uh, for example. And so here's, here's one example I think I have on the next slide. Let me look here, real quick here. Um, okay, so I'm forgetting what that one does. But this is, this is a picture of the kind of thing you can do. So if you have one of those RTL SDR uh, USB dongles, uh, you would hook that up to the computer. And that box, uh, big box on the left, is a representation of, of that hardware. And quite literally, you draw lines between these boxes, you aim the arrows in the right direction, and it's, it's just a high-level block diagram. And you say, well, how can this work? Well, underneath, uh, there are uh, computer models that represent all of these things. And if you want to get into those details, you can, because it's all free and open source software. Uh, you could see what, what does it mean to do uh, low-pass filtering in, in, a, in a computer program. You could see how they do it. Uh, and then go through and, 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 you know, see how each of these pieces work. Or you could stay at a high level, draw the block diagram, and, uh, and then and hit the go button and see what happens. So one application that I wrote is an FM radio receiver using an RTL SDR dongle. And it's got limited uh, bandwidth. I think it's a couple of megahertz. But this is what I, I got it to display without too much effort. Uh, you can see there's a strong FM radio station here right around 99.5 megahertz. And oh, there it is right there, the station uh, drop down WCRB out of Boston. And I programmed three or four stations into that drop down menu. And it will jump to that frequency. And you'll hear that FM station coming out of your computer speaker, all with the uh, software defined radio techniques in the software. Uh, another program for doing software-defined radio is called GQRX. Uh, it can talk to the same uh, type of RTL SDR dongles and many other uh, types of, uh, of SDR hardware. Uh, you might recognize that frequency, 162.525, is one of the frequencies for uh, NOAA weather radio. And around here, there's a couple of those that I can pick up. Uh, but this is the strongest one, and I was listening to that one day uh, on the computer. Uh, you tell it, you know, what kind of a signal it is and what you want your filter widths to be and so forth and uh, hit the right couple of buttons. And uh, before you know it, you're hearing uh, that station uh, on your computer, you know, hook the dongle up to an appropriate antenna, of course. I haven't played with this program. Uh, this is a relatively new one that seems to have a lot of bells and whistles called SDR Angel. Uh, I threw it in here uh, to give it some visibility so people would download it and use it. But as far as I know, it's uh, one of the few programs out there that supports the uh, M17 digital voice modes, which I, I haven't talked about yet, but I think I'm about to. So what do I think is new and cool out there? Well. Uh, I, I like the idea of digital voice, and there's many proprietary implementations out there now. Uh, one, one such uh, implementation is DSTAR, but there are others. Uh, but I, I like to stay with uh, the free and open source software, uh, not the proprietary stuff. So the, this kind of stuff is more interesting to me. Uh, and this program is called Free DV, Free Digital Voice. Uh, it's been out there for a while. It was uh, invented by a fellow named David Rowe, uh, Victor Kilo 5 Delta Golf Romeo down in Australia. Uh, I, I assume he had a couple of colleagues help him. I'm not 
positive of that. But uh, it's widely believed that this software uh, has no issues with patent encumbrances or anything of that nature because it's based on his college thesis work from many decades ago. And uh, that's been out for a while now. But what some folks decided to do is take the, uh, the, uh, the codec from it and create a project called M17 where uh, they're trying to reproduce the kinds of things that you can do with DSTAR except using this uh, encoding decoding mechanism uh, from Codec 2. And it's a very active project, uh, M17. Uh, the gentleman who leads the project is in Poland. Uh, there's some folks 20 minutes north of me in New Hampshire that are involved and, and so forth. And uh, the link is here, m17project.org. That's actually a little tricky to find because apparently there's a, a military weapon called M17 and the, the search engine gets a little confused uh, as to what you want. But one of the things I did for this project is I took a couple of those uh, TYT uh, MD380 uh, transceivers, they're uh, DMR uh, handheld transceivers, and I, I voided the warranty. I wore my I void warranties t-shirt, I voided the warranty, I hacked the hardware and uh, followed the instructions and got them to uh, be able to communicate using the uh, Codec 2 uh, voice encoder and decoder uh, on, these, on these handhelds. Uh, they were much happier having been limit, liberated from running proprietary software, and uh, I have had a chance to use them with buddies of mine. I did two of them because having one by itself doesn't do you much good. And I put that some of that software I put on the most recent version of Andy's Ham Radio Linux to uh, let people get their feet wet, to give the project some uh, advertising and so forth. And uh, I'm, I'm eager to learn a lot more about M17. I just haven't quite uh, had time to jump into it yet. So this is the point where I want to thank everybody who downloaded it, uses it, tried it, hated it, loved it, whatever the case may be. Um, I, I would probably create this uh, software collection anyway because I like it. But at a certain point, I said, you know, I should try to share it with people. So way back in uh, May of 2011, uh, I released the first version, version 10.10, because .10, I, I didn't think the first nine versions were worthy of leaving my home. Uh, and then gradually the downloads uh, increased uh, to where they are today on the far right, uh, version 25, which includes version 25 and version 25A. So almost two years worth of data there. It's a little over 18,000 downloads. So I want to thank everybody who, who has downloaded it, who uses it, tried it, and, and so forth. Uh, and, and this helps uh, you know, people by word of mouth will will tell their friends and, and hopefully more and more people try it. Uh, I'm, I'm really pleased to see those numbers and, and a little bit surprised, actually, uh, but pleasantly so. Uh, this was very surprising to me. A couple of years ago, I got an email from the folks at SourceForge and they said, hey, Andy, congratulations. Over the 11 years that it's been out there, there have been 100,000 downloads of this software. Uh, frankly, that blew me away. I had no clue that there had been that many downloads over uh, those years. So I, I was super pleased about that. And, and once again, thanks to uh, the user community for your interest. So SourceForge.net, that's the website you would want to go to. Uh, search for my call sign. Uh, other programs that I have written uh, are out there as well. But you want to look for the Andy's Ham Radio Linux uh, in order to, to try this out. Uh, or you can ask uh, Bob, he's relatively local and uh, down there, and he can help you out uh, with his experience. Um, some of the other programs I've written, uh, my MicrobitX software I, I uploaded for folks, uh, uh, programs I've written for a couple of Bionics devices with uh, their assistance at the, uh, the software interface for their devices. Uh, my current club president, George Kilo in India Golf, uh, has, was uh, many, many years in the Navy, did a lot of CW there, and uh, he created a system that he calls Wordsworth uh, for learning CW, and I, I helped him with a couple of uh, Linux-based programs to assist people in learning CW that way. And uh, the program that I wrote called AA Analyzer for older uh, rig expert antenna analyzers so that you can download that data uh, feed it to your favorite spreadsheet or whatever whatever you want to do with it. It does not work with the newer Zoom models. I haven't had a chance to get in there and do that yet, but it does work for the older models. 
Um, so other places where you can get information about Andy's Ham Radio Linux, I understand, uh, you know, this is being recorded. And so wherever you folks post it online, people will be able to access it. Uh, quite some, well, not quite some time ago, it was a few months ago, I did a presentation for uh, Rat Pack. Uh, it's a group called Radio Amateur Training, Planning and Activities Committee. And I put the uh, link there for the talk that I gave them, very similar to this talk. And uh, a gentleman on YouTube who calls himself the old tech guy, a fellow named Kevin, KB9RLW, mm -hmm. did a, a very fair review of Andy's Ham Radio Linux, showed the good parts, the good, the bad, the ugly. Uh, he, he tripped on a couple of things, and, and it, it was all totally fair. And uh, if, if you want to see uh, something uh, of his experience, take a look at that YouTube video. And this is my last slide. So I want to, uh, I'm going to open it up for questions uh, in case anybody has any. And uh, also thank you for the opportunity to uh, give you this talk. So let me, let me take a breath here for a minute and get a drink of water. And uh, who, uh, who out there has any questions for me? Um, I've got a question. Okay, let's about play a show of hands. Who's still awake? <laughs> okay. That's fair. Thank about, you. Uh, uh, the satellite program um, for watching where the satellites are in the footprint and stuff. That's uh, very interesting. Have you gotten uh, to the point where you can control radios, uh, particular Doppler shifts and stuff on linear satellites and like that? Um, yes, the software, the software supports controlling, uh, doing rig control to control radios, change frequency for Doppler and so forth. Uh, it all also has uh, pieces where it will control uh, a variety of different uh, rotators for satellite antennas. It'll do both. Oh, really? Okay. And yep. so do you have a, do you download, download the LTEs from the, um, from NORAD or whatever for getting the... Yes, uh, it will download the TLE files. It'll keep those updated and, and so forth so that you'll know where the satellite really is. Okay. Interesting. Uh, and in, you can... Oh, can sorry. you interface uh, a different computer or sorry, different radios with that software? Yes, you can. A, a lot of different radios actually. Okay. Interesting. Thank you. Uh, in fact, when I, when I built my satellite rotator and put a, a boom stick on there with wire sticking out of it for an antenna, uh, I lived in uh, Chelmsford, Massachusetts at the time. And the very, it, it was like five degrees in January, but I was really excited. I got out there. There was snow on my driveway a little bit. Uh, I put the tripod out there, fired it up. And uh, the very, very first satellite contact I made was a guy 15 miles north of me in Nashua, New Hampshire. Yeah. And, and, and yet uh, it, was, it, it was probably a 2,000 mile contact, even though you're. Yeah, miles more away. than likely. And so I, I had expected <laughs> something different, but the gentleman sent me a great looking QSL card, and that uh, got me hooked for a while. But uh, admittedly, I, uh, I found warmer days to be out there. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Sure. Uh, are there other questions out there? Well, um, Andy, I've got a question. Um, when it comes time to update the software, does it is what maybe you put in for files maintained and all that? So you ask a great question, Greg. Uh, updates are always a little bit tricky. And so I, there's a couple of different things that are supported. So for anybody who's familiar with a standard Ubuntu Linux system, uh, there's ways to update that either on the command line or through a graphical interface to talk to uh, Ubuntu's computers, otherwise known as repositories. And Ubuntu has their software out there uh, the, the update mechanism says, okay, here are the versions I have, here are the versions that are available, and it downloads and installs the right things. And that works for the overwhelming majority of the software in the Andy's Ham Radio Linux software collection. But there are some programs, I think around 20 or so, that won't update that way because either the program is not in the Ubuntu repository or the version they have there is so old as to not be useful anymore. So what I've done in those cases is I've downloaded the source code and compiled it myself and installed it for you and tied it to the menu system and so forth. So unless you know how to do that, you would not be able to update those pieces of software short of going to a whole new version of Andy's Ham Radio Linux. 
And I know for many people that's kind of painful. So I try not to do releases any more often than every six months to perhaps once a year. Okay. Well, so I was the, really uh, thinking uh, about uh, your, when your new version came out, you know, the update. Yeah. Right. So what I tell people to do there is I tell people to uh, back up their home directories and you should always do that just in case and install the new version fresh and then re and then, and then restore your home directory. Your home directory has all the settings for all the different pieces of software. So you won't lose that information. Any log files you have uh, for your contacts, all of that is in your home directory. Uh, and that way it, it, it does two things for you. It updates everything when you go to the new version of ha Andy's Ham Radio Linux and you don't lose uh, the stuff in your home directory. That's the easiest way. And because if you do, you know, like like on any computer system, you you upgrade to version A and then you upgrade to version A plus one, A plus two, A plus three. Before you know it, you have a lot of crufty old files on there that are just sucking up disk space. And at least this way. <laughs> Um, it's cleaner because it's a fresh install and you don't have a lot of those, those old crummy files laying around that might cause you grief. All right. Thanks. Sure. And you don't have a windows registry getting all funged up. <laughs> I, I, I thought I heard someone say windows. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got some computers that, you know, are, uh, won't be, follow the windows 11 or whatever in the future. So this gives me an outlet to put some good software on those computers. I, I think it's a perfect outlet, Greg, even if it's a few years old, uh, you know, it, it'll allow you to kick the tires and try it out, see how you like it. Um, whatever computer you're using now, I'll, I'll guess it's a windows machine, but it might be an Apple machine. You, unless you're really mad at it for some reason, you probably don't want to delete that. You've got a lot of effort that you put in to make that work with your, your current rig right now. So if you want to experiment, my recommendation is find a, a used laptop, an older one like that, and uh, put the Linux software on it and try it. Uh, and if you do decide to like it, well, then you don't have to turn on your Windows laptop. You can just use the Linux one. But uh, at, at yeah. first, people often approach it with some trepidation, and they, they want to just try it out and see. It's, it's a new right. world. It's different. Well, but I've in got many ways. It's not so different. Just like radios. I got a lot of laptops and computers around here. <laughs> so sure. and, and the old computer will probably run faster than the new windows. computer. Well, uh, I have had people tell me that. Yeah, I've heard, I've heard that. I, I haven't played no. with it yet. My wife's tried it a bit. My son is a, uh, a Linux aficionado. He's he does. I he's not a professional IT guy. He's big, big into Linux. So uh, Chris, you could something. you could borrow one from the club and check it out if you want. <laughs> I will. I got old computers lying around too. I could yeah, I, yeah, could, well. have, I could have one up in a, in an hour or two. I'm sure. If you have any trouble happen. installing it, give me a call. I will do that, and I probably yeah. will. <laughs> so if you go on sourceforge.net, there's a, a discussion area under the Andy's Ham Radio Linux section where people uh, ask you know, for help on different questions, uh, uh, things of that nature. And you know, feel free to look in there or if you have a question that isn't answered already, you can, you can ask it there or you can send me an email, uh, my call sign at the league, and uh, I'll be happy to uh, help you out the best I can. So hey, one, one uh, of the things I want to mention, um, I am planning to go to Dayton this year. I went last year for the very first time and gave a talk similar to this. And uh, I'm planning on being there again. So if anybody's in Dayton uh, in May, uh, feel free to come over and shake hands and say yeah. hi. Hey, Andy, there's a question in the chat from somebody who's having audio problems. The okay. question is, will the distribution run on Raspberry Pi? Uh, the answer to that is no, because Raspberry Pi, the uh, processor on it, I believe is an ARM processor, and that's an entirely different architecture than, than most PCs. And yeah. so, no, it won't work there. Uh, there is a version of Linux that runs on Raspberry Pi. It's called Raspbian, and people have uh, asked me if I would uh, remaster Raspbian and put this software on there. And I, I've thought about it, but I, I haven't done it. 
And uh, one of the reasons was that earlier Raspberry Pi models probably didn't quite have enough horsepower to do all of this. I don't believe that's true anymore. I, I believe they are sufficiently powerful to do it. Uh, I, I just have not done it. And I'm, I'm not sure how much interest there really would be. And I guess I wouldn't know until I tried it and watched the downloads. <laughs> well, uh I can say this is just such a contribution to ham radio. So you're really giving back to the hobby with this. So thank you, Greg. Yeah. Appreciate the kind words. So I sent you the slides in email, Greg. You right. also have uh, the recording here. Uh, so I, I think, you know, between your club and whomever else might access your website, folks can get at the information. And that's really what I want to do. Just get the word out that this exists uh, hopefully people will try it. You know, some number of people will like it and use it. And just to help, you know, spread the word as to what is available uh, for us hams to uh, control our radios and have fun with the right. hobby. Well, it's really been an excellent presentation. Well, uh, thanks, Greg. Appreciate that. I'm, I'm glad to have had the opportunity. And, uh, you know, if, if, like I said, if anybody has questions, please get yeah. a hold of me. Well, are there more questions? And Andy, you might drop your share so we can see each other there. Um, let's, let's see. Oh, wait a minute. Let's try this. Did that do it? No. Uh, that might yeah. have. Here we go. <laughs> okay. There we go. Sorry about that. All right. Well, what do you guys think? <laughs> I'm very impressed with it. So, so Andy, I do have a quick a question. Um, I I basically started off being interested because I wanted to run ham clock. Now ham clock is okay. is pretty pretty cool. It looks cool. It's got a lot of data in it, and I got that working. But if I wanted to update something like uh, Grid Tracker, which seems to get software updates about every month or twice a month, yeah. sometimes. Yeah. Is there a, a way that I can do that uh, through the GUI or through through the uh, command line and not have to download it again and recompile it? So last time I checked, uh, there was a version of Grid Tracker in the Ubuntu repository. And so, you know, I believe that one was fairly up to date. You know, you can always download the Debian and file and install it manually if you if you want to. Um, a lot of folks know how to do that. Other folks you know, would rather not do it that way, but there are a couple of options for doing it. I, I thought it was the Ubuntu repository, but now that I think about it, it might be its own PPA. And I, I added that, if it is its own PPA, I added that to the appropriate uh, file so that it would just be seamless. All right. Well, uh, once again, I want to thank you, Andy, for uh, joining us and um, um, uh, giving us a very interesting uh, presentation for our, our Monday Zoom. And this is certainly good for beginners and, and returning hams, I would say. So uh, thanks so much. Now, you mentioned about uh, sharing your computer earlier. Yeah, if you want, I can try to do that. Yeah. Let's see if uh, if Zoom will let me do that or if I'm going to get infinite screen inside of a screen. Let's see here. So I guess Zoom runs on Linux? <laughs> I'm running it through the uh, Chromium browser. Oh, oh, okay. And I said join via the browser. I'm not using oh, okay. any Zoom okay. app or anything like that. Um, let's see here. Will it let me do this? Um, doesn't seem like it wants to let me do that. There, I, I see a selection for entire screen and I select that. Oh, there it goes. Got to click it. All right. Hopefully this doesn't do anything bad. Okay. So you can probably see my zoom window there. Let me. Yeah, we're nope. zoom in zoom.
Yeah. That. Okay. Can you just see my background now? And, and, and all I do. That? Right. Yeah, okay. So the menu that I was showing and that someone asked me about is this round button right up here. And when you click it, it looks like that initially. And there's some programs that you can put here uh, to, to help you out. But the one that I added was this one here, the Andy Ham Radio Linux. And so that will look like the slides that I showed. And then, of course, you can go in here and, and click on, you know, whatever you want. So if you wanted this Moxon rectangle program, for example, you just click that and you can see here it is. It popped up. So, you know, we can do different things with it. If we want to make this for the two meter band and we're going to use, uh, I don't know, let's say we've got some old 14 gauge wire laying around. Uh, somebody also put in this, the, the, is it called standard wire gauge? They use in Europe. I, I got a patch from somebody for that. Uh, or you can just put in the actual size of the wire. And uh, yeah, I'll leave it in inches and do a quick calculate. And there we go. Um, I can print it to a file. So there's my, my PDF file. And yep, and I can also save it to you know some antenna modeling. So I can say which, write it to a model. Do I want horizontal or vertical? And it'll it'll save the proper file for uh, XNEC 2C. Andy, so if I want to bring that for, program up, I could do it. Is this good for fox hunting? This antenna? Um, this one here? No, there's a tape measure antenna that's out there that you can find instructions for. You can use PVC pipe and tape measures uh, cut to the right lengths and mounted at the right distances. That does much better because it has a cardioid uh, pattern to its reception. So it's fairly insensitive off the back and very, very sensitive going forward. Um, and I would recommend you use an antenna like that. Uh, it's very cheap to build, but uh, uh, honestly, if, if you can't cut a tape measure to the right length, I, I don't know if I can help you, um, but, <laughs> well, you but a, a lot of people build them and they have fun with them, <laughs> you know. Um, so, so other things in here, was there any particular menu uh, that anybody wanted to maybe have me talk about in a little bit more detail? Well, I know with Windows, there. There's the COM ports and all that, which is confusing enough. Does that carry over to the programs that are in, in your Andy's Linux? So Linux doesn't have a concept of COM ports. Everything in Linux looks like a file. And when you pull up something like FL Digi, if I had the appropriate uh, uh, hardware hooked up, if I had my radio hooked up and so forth, and you... Uh, drop down the menu for you know, the quote unquote COM port, it would show you the Linux equivalent name of that. And you would select that and then it would know how to talk, uh, for example, over USB to your radio. But there isn't a, like a COM1, a COM2, yeah. COM3. It doesn't do it that way. In fact, the, the names of these things are kind of long because it includes the name of the device and everything else in there. And so they're usually... Uh, even though they're they're awfully long to to type, they're pretty easy to figure out once you see that. All right, they have me. Go ahead, Bill. No, or just say they have meaning. The name <laughs> is the meaning. Yes, they they really do, and it it took them a while to get there. But that way, you don't have to worry about is this thing on uh you know TTY USB zero or USB one or two. You don't have to worry about that. It uh, when you plug the device in, it it creates the appropriate link, and you just have to select uh, the right link, and and you're there. And uh, that that works really really well. Is there a, a package manager sort of uh, interface that we can use to update software? There, There is a graphical package manager, but I, I tend to use the uh, command line one because I, I know it so well. Uh, and I'm trying to remember what it's what it's called because uh, <clears throat> I don't use it that often. But there is a graphical uh, package manager in here. Uh, where would that be? I forget what the darn thing is called now. But it, there is one in here. I'm sure of it. Is the use semantic? Yeah, I'm, I'm not finding it right now, but it's it's in here. Okay. Synaptic package manager. That's it. 
<clears throat> the the software that might uh, replace uh, Winlink has got me kind of interested. What kind of specs has it got for uh, uh, signal to noise ratios and stuff? The 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 Vera package with Winlink has been quite impressive. That our uh, Aries people are using. Are you getting anywhere close to that? And in, in, in um, I, I can't answer that that question in that level of detail. Uh, what I can tell you is that the NBeam software suite uses FL Digi and a couple of other related programs, uh, and whatever. Uh, modes you can transfer messages by in FL Digi. You could you could use uh, uh, you know all different kinds of, of digital modes to do it. As long as you and the other side agree on what mode to use, uh, it's it's really really flexible. Uh, there's a program that goes with that for sending the uh, different uh, formatted messages. Now I'm not an MCOM person, so I'm I'm on the end of a limb here. Uh, there's, there's those the standard message formats where you fill in the blanks and send it. Uh, with word counts and all, and and those pieces of uh, software all all work together to create this system called NBeams. It's it's not just one program; it's it's a suite of programs that play together. Okay, I understand. Yeah, so you could almost use uh, much like JS8 Call used uh, Joe Taylor's algorithms. You could incorporate that into into this. Uh system as well if you wanted. Um, I, I believe that you could. I, I've not tried it and I've not seen anything where anybody did, but in theory, I think it should work. Yeah. The, the, the big thing Winlink's got is all these servers set up all over the world, uh, mm -hmm. you know, relaying into people's snail mail system, which, but I, I think that'll come to an end. I, I can't see why we should be going to a proprietary uh, company, you know, to be doing this kind of stuff with ham radio personally. I, I'm right. a big advocate for non-proprietary stuff. Right. I mean, on one hand, you know, the folks who write WinLink have a right to, you know, write it any way they want for any computer they want. They have every right to license it the way they want. And, and I appreciate the effort that they're putting in for the folks who choose to use it. But like, like yourself, I, I personally prefer the free and the open source. Uh, I think more people can contribute to it. Uh, find bugs, create patches, so on and so forth. Um, you know, it tends to be, a, a, you know, it's, it's open, it's, it's defined, people can see what's there and maybe add things to it that the original authors didn't consider. So that, that's the way I, I go. But, you know, the Winlink team probably has limited resources. And, you know, for whatever reason, they either don't have a Linux program or maybe they just choose not to go that way. I, I'm not sure. I've never spoken to them. But it's out there. It works. Uh, but but if I were to jump into it, I would probably go the NBeams route. And there are you know big MCOM organizations out there that uh, that are doing just that. Interesting. Thank you. Okay. Does anybody have uh, anything else that uh, I can show them or answer for you? <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to stop sharing here for a minute, but I can I can always turn it back on if I if I need to. Just out of curiosity, uh, show of hands, how many people out there are members of SKCC and, and play around with the different events they have? A couple <laughs> of folks? Cool. Well, if I don't have your number, uh, send me a send me a message someday and I'll, I'll trade numbers with you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm 6265S. Uh, 7726. I'm 5123. Tango. <laughs> Good stuff. I'm a yeah, old... they, were, they were extraordinarily patient with me when I was barely doing five words a minute. Yeah, I was a little bit curious about the uh, CW files you have in your program. Um, we have a number of people who are interested in learning CW, and there are, I guess, various ways to go about doing that. But a lot of stuff is being done online these days. Yep, that's true. So if I go to, can you see my screen and my menus? Yes, mm -hmm. sure can. Yeah. Okay, so one of the programs that can help with that is this one called XCWCP, which I mentioned before, and I don't know if you'll hear the audio, but. Yeah. I can hear it. 
Yes. Okay. So, I mean, you can, you can play with this to your heart's content. You can set it to anything you want. You know, um, you can set whatever tone you like. I like 600 myself. I'll play with the volume and so forth. Uh, but there's other things you can do. You can do letters, numbers, alphanumeric, English words, uh, CW words. <laughs> Etc. So there's all different kinds of things you can uh, choose to drill yourself on. Um, and you just write it down and compare it to, to here later. Um, uh, there, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't simulate static. It doesn't simulate uh, fading or anything of that nature. It's, it's just your basic uh, uh, hear a letter, uh, type a letter kind of thing, uh, which was, was taught for many, many years, uh, especially in the military, because these things, as I understand it, were uh, encrypted. So you didn't know what letter you were going to get. You couldn't predict it. So that, um, that's a, a program that I used for a while. Um, other stuff that's in here, uh, for example, is uh, this is a, a text-based program that does uh, similar things. And uh, there's a good website, I, website that I found, uh, LCWO. So that's Lima Charlie Whiskey Oscar.net, LCWO.net. It stands for Learn CW Online. And uh, let's see, where is, oh, it's covering that up. I wanted to bring up the browser and pull that up, but the, the stop sharing thing is hiding my, my thing at the bottom here. So I can't get at it. But uh, yeah, go to that website and uh, it's, a, it's a free account and it keeps uh, statistics on your progress, which is kind of nice. Well, thank you, Andy. And thank you for coming into our, our group this evening. Interesting presentation. <laughs> well, I'm glad folks enjoyed it. Again, it was my pleasure to, to do this for you. And I hope uh, for folks that weren't able to make it to the meeting tonight that, uh, you know, they're able to look at, at the recording and the slides and so forth and, and get something out of it. Um, so with that, folks, if there are no other questions or anything, I will, I will be signing clear. <laughs>